Welcome. My name is Ian Booth Kelly. I'm an adjunct professor of constitutional criminal law and procedure at the John F. Kennedy University School of Law and also at the San Francisco Law School. The Soul Opera Company invited me to come and give a short talk before the show, and I am awfully grateful and obliged for folks who made it here an hour early to hear it. And I am just so, I, it's, it's so great to be in front of a live audience back in the theater again, right? So, this is a talk in three parts. Part one, a brief history of the Constitution. Part two, part two, everything I need to know I learned in law school. And part three, some thoughts about the future. And you'll note that the first part is really long and the next two parts are, are pretty short. And it occurred to me that that sort of tracks the Constitution itself. If you look at a, like a photo of the Constitution, you'll be struck at how very long the first article is, the one, the one dealing with Congress, and how comparatively short articles two and three are, the one dealing with the president and the one dealing with the courts. There was an early approach to constitutional interpretation that reckoned that by the first part being so much bigger, it was therefore that much more important. And that's one interpretive approach to the Constitution. We're going to talk about a few. And so let me start part one, a brief history of the Constitution. Well, most people know where this story started, and it, it largely started July 2nd through the 4th of 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Probably the most famous political sentence in the English language, and one not without its problems, and those are, it's a lecture for another day. Uh, and that set off the revolution and the colonists broke from England, and that's what they were, they were the colonists. In 1776, people didn't really conceive of themselves as Americans. If you would have asked a colonist where they were from, if they were in a foreign land, as Ben Franklin was over there in France, they'd have said, well, I'm, I'm a Virginian, or I'm a Pennsylvanian, or I'm a New Yorker. That was the manner in which they understood themselves. And that went on for a long time. The revolution ran for five-ish years, it ended, the, the facts on the ground, it ended with the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown in 1781. A peace treaty wasn't signed for a couple of years, but functionally, the revolution was over in 1781, and we started being a self-governing entity, a confederation of states, and that was what we operated under, the, the Articles of Confederation. And that was the governing document of the United States there in the beginning, and the Articles of Confederation provided for a Congress and not a great deal else. And it's generally, there was no president, there was no courts flowing from, flowing from the Articles of Confederation. And it's generally viewed that the Articles stopped working because it did not give to Congress the power to get money from the states, to pay for the revolution, to pay off the debts of the young country. And it did not allow for free trade between the different states, which broke into little trade jealousies and sort of mini civil wars right there at the founding. And so this went all the way up to 1787, when a committee was formed and summoned to Philadelphia with delegates from all of the different states to amend the Articles of Confederation. But that's not really what was on the table. Uh, a very young James Madison, who was 36 years old, a very, very, very young Alexander Hamilton was 30 years old. Boy, I tell you, I've been teaching for give or take 20 years. I've been through five presidential elections. I don't think anything has fired the interest of my students coming into class quite like Hamilton when that happened. So I'm very lucky on that account, and I'm going to assume many folks know a piece of that part of the story. An interesting and not much reckoned part is just how young he was. And although they were gathering together delegates from all of the states, the two of them really had a grand design, that they were not there merely to amend the Articles of Confederation. They were there to do something new. And they knew that this thing that they were trying to do needed some, it needed legitimacy, it needed some gravitas behind it. So what did they do? Well, they, they hit up George Washington, whom Hamilton was close with, that he could come and preside 
over, over this gathering, be the president of what was to become the Constitutional Convention. And they were all very young, so they reached out to the oldest politician they had, Benjamin Franklin. He was 81 years old. They held it in Philadelphia. He lived in Philadelphia. And they got him in, and he was borne aloft into, into the hall every day on like a chair with four people carrying him. He was an old man. And this all gave it all some legitimacy. Washington was 55, Franklin was 81. And through this, hammering it out in that long, hot summer of 1787, they wrote a constitution. That constitution was ratified uh, finally in June of 19, 1778 with New Hampshire. It then became the law of the land. We, the people of the United States of America. Now, the great offering of the Constitution, this notion, we the people, that was good. The notion that sovereignty and the power to govern did not descend from God, but instead arose from the will of the people and the consent of the governed, that was a pretty new idea, but it had been kicking around for a while. It informed the founders' deliberations rather than flowed from them. The great new idea of the Constitution was the notion that there could be, on that account, more than one sovereign. It wasn't just one king, it wasn't just one president. We could have a system where the governed are natural citizens of the states from which they came, and they consented to give some of that power to a new creation, to a federal body, which would govern over all by consent. And that notion of two sovereigns, that notion of federalism, was the Constitution's great contribution to Western political thought. Now, this created some issues. The Constitution left us really with one main tension and one background problem, and you might recognize both of these. The main tension in the Constitution was the balance between state and federal power. What power properly reposes with this newly created federal government of which everyone was suspicious, they just gotten rid of one king and weren't looking for another, and what power properly reposed with the several states? It was ever thus. There's a simmering background problem not readily apparent in the Constitution, though it's much more relevant to the show we're here today to see, and this was the problem of interpretation. The Constitution does not tell us how we are supposed to interpret it. It does not give us any particular guidance on the way in which we are supposed to read it and reckon it. And so it created some immediate interpretive problems. The first interpretive problem of the Constitution is who does the interpretation? Although the Constitution provided for a Congress and a President and courts, it didn't say any place, oh, and by the way, the courts get the last word. It didn't say that, and that was not clear, and that was not clear for the first 17 years or so of the Republic until a Supreme Court case, Marbury v. Madison, a couple nodding heads, some, some lawyers and law students here, and, and this case under the great, uh, the second Chief Justice John Marshall, taught us that, no, it's really the courts that do the interpretation. It's natural because we're courts, and our business is to know what laws are. Uh, first big interpretive problem. Second big interpretive problem is sort of how narrowly or broadly we ought to interpret the Constitution. The Constitution granted to the federal government the power to have a post office. But it didn't say anything about post roads or to purchase the carriages necessary for a post office. The Constitution granted the federal government power to mint coins but it didn't say anything about banks or what to do with it. And so, well, how, how does that work? Because it wasn't explicitly written into the Constitution. There's one provision there buried in Article Two that says, oh, by the way, Congress will have the power to do anything that's necessary and proper to carry out these other powers. You know, necessary and proper. Well, does that include, let's say, starting a bank in order that we can do something with this coin? And that question wasn't answered until 7, 1819, a case called McCulloch v. Maryland, when the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's, that's how we read the necessary and proper clause. Necessary means, necessary means reasonably necessary. And so we start down the interpretive road. These were the problems 
that they faced at the beginning. And then new problems came along because that carried us into the 1840s and 50s. And then the war came. And that really re-rolled the constitutional dice as the balance between state and federal power was shifted again. And the immediate aftermath of the Civil War rang out for 50 years through the Constitution until real notions of interpretation started to ascend in the early part of the 20th century. And to jump ahead a little only to come back, the two broad schools of thought on constitutional interpretation have developed as we sit here now in 2021 into two schools of thought that I will call originalism and the living constitution. Now, originalism is the theory of original meaning. The appropriate manner in which to interpret the Constitution is to interpret it according to what reasonable people in 1788 would have understood it to mean. This was Justice Scalia's view. This is a comparatively new view. It was first proposed academically in the early 1970s by a judge named Robert Bork, since famous for other things. And it reached the Supreme Court, really with Justice Scalia's appointment in 1986. This is why he's such an important justice to people who read the Constitution that way, because he was the one who really carried originalism to the courts. And I, I would argue that it is, if not uh, an ascendant view now, it's certainly close to being one. But to say that it's new isn't to say that it doesn't have its roots in the Constitution itself. Uh, James Madison said, he said, I entirely concur in the propriety of resorting to the sense in which the Constitution was accepted and ratified by the nation. In that sense alone, it is the legitimate Constitution. Enthusiasts of interpretation love to grab something a founder said to sort of pull them to one side or the other, and so, that was Madison's view. What's good? What's good and bad about originalism? Well, what's good? It is very appealing in its analytic straightforwardness. To analyze the Constitution as an originalist is to be very clear on what it is you are supposed to be doing. And in theory, this produces clear and consistent results, in theory. What is not good about this approach to interpretation? Well, it, it binds us to the view of people who lived 250 years ago. Apparently no more and no less than that. That's, that's the big problem with it. At the other end of the analytic spectrum, and, and I need to be clear, I'm, I'm somewhat oversimplifying this for purposes of a short talk. There are, of course, many strands of originalism, many strands of what I'm gonna talk about here. There's stuff I'm getting right, and there's stuff I'm getting wrong. There is a, a link to my office's website there in the program. If I'm getting it right or wrong, please write me and tell me so. This is how I learn, as I will say more about in a moment. But the other end of the spectrum is the approach that has come to be called the living constitution, a theory of evolving meaning. Here's how a case in 1958 said it. It said, we interpret the constitution by reference to our evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. The evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. This was Justice Ginsburg's view. This view developed somewhat earlier academically. It developed in the early 1900s behind Woodrow Wilson, who was an academic before he was the president. It was carried to the court by Oliver Wendell Holmes, a famous and storied justice. But again, those notions behind living constitutionalism were not new in the 1900s. Uh, Jefferson said, he said, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. So some observations on this, what's good? Well, much of the Constitution requires moral interpretation. The most important words and phrases of the Constitution are not things with definitions we all agree upon. And so how we look at a term like liberty isn't a question of what the word liberty means. It's a question of what sorts of liberties are entitled to constitutional protection. And there's a very good argument that 
evolving views of terms like liberty are necessary for the Constitution to work to protect the people who were not protected by the founders. Women, the descendants of slaves, people who are not heterosexual. For the Constitution to protect them, we have to have an evolving sense of what it means. Now, what's not good about a living Constitution? Well, it allows for a type of judicial interpretation that some think does not impose principal limits on judges. It allows the court to make policy rather than just interpret it. And so there's a basic debate that we've had for a long time. What controls belong to the federal government and what to the states? What rights and interests should be protected by the term liberty? How do we best interpret the Constitution? It is on these issues that Justices Scalia and Ginsburg often disagreed. But uh, we, we love to talk about their disagreement, and we're here today because they, they seem to tell us something. They, they are teaching us a lesson that we want to learn. But it's worth noting that the Supreme Court does not disagree as much as folks might think, neither today nor when Justices Scalia and Ginsburg sat astride the bench, nor ever. More Supreme Court opinions are unanimous than not, and always have been. Justices Scalia and Ginsburg themselves agreed in about 70% of cases. We look to the cases that seem like social and cultural flashpoints to see their disagreement because on some level we view the Supreme Court as sort of fighting a proxy war for what's going on in the rest of America. And so we tend to highlight those disagreements. But like, you know, many friends and family members, they agreed much more than they did not. It's those areas of disagreement that we, we tend to reflect upon. And so brief reflections, that's part one. Part two. Everything I need to know I learned in law school. And this one's short, because I only have three things to tell you. And these are things I learned, and these are things I teach my students, and these are things that I think many of the better lawyers keep in their mind when they go. Start with the most important one right up front. Number one, reasonable minds may disagree. I don't have more to say about it than that. Reasonable minds may disagree. If you start from there, the rest becomes easy. The goal of a conversation, number two, the goal of a conversation is not to win. It is to learn something, and if you are lucky, to teach something. Number three, recognize the difference between an enemy and a friend with whom you disagree. It is incredibly important in the life of a lawyer. I think it's incredibly important for all of us. Well, part three, some thoughts about the future. I've had this stuff on my mind given the week, month, and year that we've had. How can you not? How can you not? Uh, historian Heather Cox Richardson says it this way. She says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. <laughs> we are living history right now, and it's history of a very dire sort. People are on edge, and people are on edge for good reason. Uh, we stand here... 20 years from the defining political event of my own life, 20 years ago yesterday. My family is here today. I, I learned that my oldest son, I learned that my wife was pregnant with my oldest son one week after 9-11. I was waiting for the bar results. It was a, a tense few months. And so this boy is 19 years old. For his entire life, the United States has been at war. He has never known an America not at war. There's reason for optimism. He's known the last two weeks, and maybe moving forward. We sit here masked and distant behind a public health crisis with no clear end in sight. And the earth has been heating up since the start of the 20th century, with the last seven years being the warmest ever recorded. We are living in history, and we are on edge with very good reason. But I believe, I believe, I believe there is a way forward. The truth and the starting place, there's nothing broken. There's nothing broken that we could not fix with science, ingenuity, and the will to fix it. We have not crossed some threshold from which there's no going back. At every point, we could turn back. What we need to do is to find that will. We need, if possible, to find those places where we agree. 
Someone came up to me after Friday's talk and said, well, yeah, but how are we going to do that? And said, well, again, that's the next part of the lecture. I can only do so much at one night. I, uh, you know, like a good teacher, I identify the problems. I do not have all of the solutions myself. They're above my pay grade and outside my area of expertise. <laughs> but I can illuminate the problems. We need to find the places where we agree. History does not repeat, but it sure does rhyme. The Constitution is a good place to start. So here's a question. What is the purpose of government? And the question is popped right back up to as ever thus. Well, the preamble to the Constitution suggests an answer to that question. The goal of government is broadly as follows. To establish justice, to provide for the common defense, and to promote the general welfare. Those three goals gave rise to a tool, the Constitution, and that tool had an explicit purpose, to form a more perfect union. When we say it like that, it seems obvious. How is it that we still have so much disagreement? What stands in the way of our making that more perfect union. I had this on my mind as I was writing my speech. I, they, they asked me to deliver this speech when we first planned this show in, in 2019. And I said, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm up in front of class every week. And I got a million of them. I'm ready for it. And it's taken a long time to get here, so I've had a long time to think about it. And I was at a family event just last weekend. It was the first one I've been to in a couple of years for many of us, and as, as is common with this sort of thing, I was thrown together for the first time in a long time with folks whose politics are very different than my own. And you know, they like to, they like to bait me and get me talking, and then so we did, and so I found myself having some, you know, dire arguments with some dear loved ones, and what I saw is that we were arguing about two different things. We could not come to agreement on so very many things because we were not working from the same set of facts. And this, I think, gives a lot of insight into why Justices Scalia and Ginsburg could disagree so profoundly but still be so close. And it also gives insight into why so many of us find ourselves in such deep and profound disagreement with people whom we otherwise feel very close to. And this is because in America today, we are not getting our information from a shared and trusted place. We are all working from different places of information with very different levels of accuracy. In this way, it's much easier for the Supreme Court. The facts at the Supreme Court are settled. They're not like a regular court, like on television. There's, there's no place for a jury. They don't try cases. The facts have already been decided. Lower courts have done things. The facts have become enmeshed in the record, and that's it. The jury decided the light was green, so for purposes of the Supreme Court's consideration, the light was green. Supreme Court justices, when considering a disagreement, consider it from the vantage point of shared facts. And when you have shared facts, you can work outwards. I think a big part of being able to disagree respectfully, to have a conversation where we both learn and teach, is to start with agreed upon facts. From there, we work our way outwards to a discussion of values. What sort of country do we want to see for ourselves and our children? How can government help accomplish this? Armed with shared facts, we can talk about the values. Working with different facts, we are stuck arguing about the facts themselves. So, these values-based discussions, in final conclusion, these value-based discussions about the role of government and the promotion of liberty, these are not new. We've been talking about these things as a nation ever since the founding. Justices Scalia and Ginsburg stand out to us because what was between them seemed to transcend their very clear political differences. 
That's why we're here. That's what we're curious about. That's the question we want to answer when we look at the two of them. How can we bridge that gap? How can we engage ourselves in the work, the work that we all should be and at this point must be turned to, the work of building a more perfect union? Thank you for listening to these thoughts. Enjoy the show.